you could think a few degrees by the end of the century, even four or five, that would be nice. I mean, I found it a little cold tonight, <laughs> arriving and landing in Wellington, coming from Belgium, where it was between 25 and 30 uh, in the other hemisphere. So wouldn't it be nice to have a few more degrees? Well, think about it. And maybe I, this will allow me to skip all the slides on impacts, etc., because you know uh, all the details. But maybe what you don't know is that a few degrees in global average uh, can, can make uh, such a big difference as the difference between this situation a little less than 20,000 years ago at the last glacial maximum when the average temperature of the Earth was no less than uh, 4 or 5 degrees cooler than today. You had on North America and Northern Europe uh, a thick uh, ice layer and when I mean thick it's really thick between 2 and 3 kilometers you had so much ice there that the sea level was on the average 120 meters lower than today. So the difference between this planet and this planet, the one we have today, is only 4 to 5 degrees globally. So in terms of the habitability of the, of the whole planet, of course the situation is different. I know we are not starting from the same starting point, etc. But I'm just trying to get you a, a sense of what it means a few degrees warming for the entire planet means big changes in the habitability of, of the planet. Um, just think about uh, sea level in this, uh, in this example. Of course, it would translate regionally into uh, increase in temperature, change in precipitation. Uh, you, you have here the details for, for, for the different scenarios for this region. It's actually hard to... Uh, uh, get something that is very clear here. Um, you have uh, maps, uh, an atlas of, of detailed uh, assessment of, of what the, um, the different scenarios would mean in different parts of the world. I, I know that also representative of small islands here, so I also uh, introduced those uh, slides of northern tropical Pacific equatorial Pacific where things are a little clear towards more precipitation probably and the southern, the southern tropical Pacific where there might be some decrease uh, sea level, sorry for the French, sea level uh, would uh, increase as well because the glaciers are melting, because the ice sheets have started to melt as well, Greenland, both Greenland and Antarctica and because water expands when you heat it of course, it depends on the scenario. There's a range, but the range is between 30 centimeters and 1 meter, additional to the 20 centimeters we have uh, seen already over the past 100 uh, years or so. Acidification is an issue as well, because it's nice to have the ocean absorbing a quarter of our emissions. It's a big service that the ocean uh, provides for us freely. It's very nice. but that CO2 contributes to an acidification of the oceans. And uh, acidification is measured by the pH. And the lower the pH is, the higher the acidity. And of course, it depends again on the scenarios for the future. In a, the lowest emission scenario, you have a, a decrease which is limited. But in the highest uh, scenario, you have a very significant uh, decrease of the pH. That means an increase in acidity. And that means, in summary, trouble for marine life uh, in, in the oceans. So impacts are already underway everywhere, from tropic to the poles, on all continents and in the oceans, affecting rich and poor. But unfortunately, uh, the poor are more vulnerable everywhere. And that is, that is a standard conclusion. Just to show you that New Zealand is uh, discussed, and I, we're not going to read all of this, just look at New Ze the word New Zealand there. Uh, of course, New Zealand uh, is discussed uh, in many parts, uh, and, and also small islands in the Pacific in many parts of the report. Uh, and um, uh, I would like now to, uh, to move to um, maybe explain one or two more diagrams. Um, this one showing, uh, and this is a concept, slide. I just want to explain the concept first and, and, and then show the application for, for this region and also for, the, for small islands. Uh, it shows the increasing 
risk level from very low to very high for the present, for the near term, 2030 to 2040, in the long term, for by the end of the century, in a world where the temperature, where the warming is limited to two degrees, and in, in the last line, uh, where the warming uh, reaches four degrees. And what is uh, striped there shows the potential for the particular area that would be covered by the specific diagram I would show. This is just a concept, okay? You don't know whether this deals with food security or risk from floods. This is just a concept. Uh, so what is um, striped here shows the potential for adaptation to reduce the risk. Because of course, for floods, coast and coastal regions, for example, to take a very simple example, if you build dikes and you build <laughs> coastal protection, which is not appropriate everywhere, but somewhere it is, uh, you can reduce uh, the risk of being flooded. That's called adaptation, just a simple example. But adaptation can reduce the risk, but cannot reduce the risk to zero, particularly in a warmer world. So in other words, adaptation has its limits. So let me illustrate. This is the exercise that has been done in the last report by the IPCC Working Group, two authors, uh, for the key regions of the world, for, for the old regions of the world, trying to find the key areas uh, uh, where uh, it's, um, the impacts were most visible. Now I will focus on, on this one, uh, which is Australasia, and the three sectors uh, mentioned a significant change in composition and structure of coral reef systems and you can see both for the two degree world and the four degree world the potential for adaptation is quite limited and for, for the four degree world it's a euphemism there is no potential for adaptation. The, another sector is increased flood damage to infrastructure and settlements etc. Increased risk to coastal infrastructure and low lying ecosystem etc. The message is Adaptation is important, can reduce the severity of impact, but has limits. And those limits are stronger, are more important in a warmer world. In other words, adaptation needs uh, to be seen in combination with mitigation. And the more you mitigate, the less adaptation you have to do. And uh, if you don't mitigate, at some point, uh, adaptation becomes uh, actually impossible. So I, I'm not going. To, these are the slides I'm going to skip, but you'll you'll be able to 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 get them afterwards. Uh, key risks for small islands are very small, uh, are very similar uh, to some of the risks mentioned for Australasia, with risk uh, very much associated to sea level rise and some adaptation options uh, still uh, allowing uh, to to minimize the severity, knowing that uh, adaptation wouldn't reduce the risk to zero. So we know that the risk of climate change would increase with continued emissions and I would like to spend the last two minutes of my talk on mitigation even if I again will, will skip uh, uh, some slides which will be available afterwards. Uh, mitigation at what level? Well this is an attempt by Working Group 2 uh, to summarize the key reasons for concern in relation to an increase in temperature and as you can see around 1.5, 2 degrees above the pre-industrial time, you enter a zone of very high additional risk due to climate change, and least for some of, at least for some of the criteria used, which in a sense gives, um, al allows us to understand uh, the, uh, the meaning, the reason why the 2 degree number was chosen by policymakers in Copenhagen in 2009 and 2010. Um, now, if you want to stay under 2 degrees, you have to look at this lower scenario, the so-called RCP 2.6. What does it mean in terms of uh, global emissions? Well, a very new and important element, and this is the last slide, I've, uh, set of three slides I'd like to explain, uh, starting here. It's a diagram showing the relationship, which is almost linear, if you look at the past data, between the total, the cumulative total of CO2 emissions on the horizontal axis, labeled in billion tons of carbon here, or here in billion tons of CO2, 
you can easily convert one to the other. And the vertical axis is the increase in temperature relative to the temperature at the end of the 19th century. Now, looking in the future with the four scenarios, you have a very similar kind of relationship, of course with some uncertainty zone because different models don't give exactly the same numbers, but you get the idea. If you want to stay below 2 degrees, for example, it means to stay, if you take more or less the middle of, of this cloud here, to stay under approximately 3,000 billion tons of CO2. Which means that every time you add a billion ton of CO2 in the atmosphere, you add some fraction of a, a, an additional degree to the global warming, and you cannot go back. Once you have added that billion tons of CO2, that billion ton of CO2, you cannot go back. So behind this diagram, uh, there, is, there are two things. The idea of urgency to mitigate, because the longer we wait to, to reduce the emissions, the more fraction of a degree we will have added, and the more difficult it will be to stay under that two degree limit, if that's the limit we want to achieve. And the other thing that's behind this diagram is this famous carbon budget, which is another way to show the same thing. I mentioned approximately 3,000. Well, the, the exact number, at least with a probability of two-thirds to stay below two degrees, is 2,900 billion tons of CO2. Um, and we have used two-thirds of that amount uh, until 2011, which means that the amount remaining is 1,000 gigaton of CO2, which when you know that we were emitting approximately 40 billion tons of CO2, remember I mentioned 8 billion tons of carbon earlier at the end of the 20th century, uh, one ton of carbon means 3.7 ton of CO2. When you burn carbon, it combines with oxygen, so it's, the weight is larger when you consider CO2. So it doesn't need a Nobel Prize in, in physics to understand that uh, there is some urgency because at this rate, in approximately 25 years, the budget is gone. So there is urgency to um, mitigate uh, because otherwise it will be very hard to adapt. So that, in a nutshell, is the message of the uh, IPCC report. And I will go to my last slide to allow you to know where, and I promise this will be done in the coming 25 or 36 hours at most, on this website you will find my slides in, under the conference um, label. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm ready to try to uh, answer your questions.